Good. All right. Well, great. Uh, look, I'm with uh, Stephen Boyd, who's uh, sector head of, of REIT uh, credit analysis at Fitch, um, an NYU alum um, from a few years back. Um, been at Fitch for, you've been there probably 10 plus years? Not quite yet. It feels like it. <laughs> it's really starting to feel like it, but it started in fall of 2012. Okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah, so yeah getting there. Years, so yeah, I'm getting there. Yeah. And uh, I know in the past uh, two or three weeks, I feel like every news day has been about a whole nother week. So mm -hmm. uh, you're going to get to 10 years sooner than you probably realized if we get through this. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, so look, my students right now are conducting uh, credit risk analysis on REITs um, and they're applying it to corporate REIT bonds. Uh, they're looking at specific issuers, specific bonds. Um, and trying to opine on the directionality of risk premiums for those specific bonds. Mm -hmm. um, I've walked them through, uh, you know, an antiquated uh, S&P approach to, to thinking about uh, read corporate Ooh. credit risk. Yeah, exactly. Thanks. <laughs> Got it. Um, and um, along with a bunch of other, you know, random stuff that I have them, you know, look at from a broader capital markets perspective. Um, and I thought uh, I came across your report was this a couple weeks ago. Um, framing U.S. REIT coronavirus risk, mm -hmm. uh, and I really liked um, the summary of basically how you winnowed down all of your your credit research into your risk factor assessments by by property sector. Um, mm -hmm. So I thought it'd be great if we could talk maybe generally about uh, the Fitch um, REIT credit rating framework, sure. um, and then how you boiled that down in today's um, I'll just call it my, uh, market environment. There's yeah. a whole lot of yeah. stuff going on. Um, and then how that um, allowed you to develop uh, this outlook and risk factors for each individual property sector. Yeah, sure. Yeah, um, maybe I'll just start a little bit about read credits and, and how we think about them at Fitch and, and then kind of dive into, you know, the, the latest scenario. But, um, you know, REITs has moved around within Fitch. We're in structured finance. We're in um, the financial institutions group and ultimately have kind of landed in uh, U.S. corporates group, um, particularly as REITs have kind of distinguished themselves as, as fully integrated operating companies with, you know, leasing, property management, development, et cetera. You know, they've been added to the S&P 500. Um, you know, I think initially when the modern read era began in the early 1990s, they were seen as more like a collection of assets or like a mutual fund of, you know, commercial real estate. And, yeah. and increasingly they've wanted to distinguish themselves and they have as, as operating companies. But having said that, you know, when you think about it relative to <clears throat> traditional industrial corporate credit ratings sort of non-financial credit ratings, there are some pretty important differences for REITs versus, um, uh, you know, other uh, enterprises, right? And so one is the REIT tax election, um, the requirement to pay out 90% of your taxable net income. That's very different from, uh, you know, your average industrial corporate that, um, you know, retains free cash flow that can be used to, to repay debt. REITs really need consistent access to, you know, debt and equity capital to, to refinance their obligations and to grow their businesses. Um, you know, we've been able, and the other rating agencies have, have been able to get comfortable with REITs um, at comparable ratings to industrial corporates, um, despite, you know, significantly higher leverage levels for a couple reasons. Um, one, it's the stability of the cash flows. So, you know, for most traditional commercial property types, uh, you've got long-term leases to credit tenants. Um, uh, which, you know, many of them wake up on January 1 and they know where 90% of their earnings are going to come from that year, right. unless there's a, a global pandemic. Um, but, you know, in, in most years, they have pretty good visibility. Um, the other key difference is uh, the contingent liquidity available from the secured uh, mortgage market, which is kind of a key differentiator relative to industrial corporate. So, you know, a manufacturer can't just go out and sort of, um, you know, get a mortgage against their operations and, um, right. you know, based on sort of the stability of the cash flows, whereas REITs can't. So those factors kind of help offset the higher leverage and the uh, cash retention constraints sort of inherent in the REIT model. Um, you know, I guess maybe just thinking about, uh, you know, where we find ourselves today. I mean, for that reason, 
you know, a lot of people focus on income-based leverage, and we do as well to a degree, sort of debt to EBITDA is kind of a measure of financial health. Um, but if you think about it, that was really designed, uh, you know, for industrial corporates as kind of a payback measure, right? They used to call it that sort of the, <laughs> how many years of cash flow, and we all know EBITDA is kind of a poor proxy for cash flow now for a variety of reasons, but at the time, uh, you know, it was a proxy for cash flow, and how many years would it take you to repay your debt? Well. For REITs, that's very theoretical, right? But I mean, they don't get to retain that cash flow. They have to pay out you know, the majority of it, maybe retain a small amount. So um, for that reason, liquidity is, is arguably a lot more important for REITs than, than some of the you know, kind of income-based leverage metrics that are commonly used. However, they can still be instructive if you assume you know, balanced maturity ladders and um, you know, it's almost like a price earnings multiple. It can give you some insight into how the business is financed. Um, but, you know, coming back to this sort of coronavirus uh, pandemic and how we were thinking about it, um, you know, REITs came into this year in really a strong position. I mean, we kind of, uh, in our outlook that we published for this year back in December, um, said we think they may be in the strongest position they've been since the modern REIT era. Um, Okay. You know, coming out of the global financial crisis, a lot of them had uh, sort of repositioned their portfolios away from more capital intensive commodity uh, assets and markets into kind of uh, more financeable, more liquid um, sort of gateway cities and, and property types like industrial or others where, you know, you had sort of, uh, they were less capital intensive than say like suburban office or things like that. So. Okay. Portfolios had improved a lot. A lot of them had delevered, um, you know, kind of learning the lesson from the, the global financial crisis. I mean, leverage is still high. You know, sector average is probably high five, is low six. And the, the sector is kind of a triple B sector for the most part. And for industrial corporates, you know, you probably more two to three times leverage a triple B. So still high, but down from, from where it had been, um, certainly kind of, heading into the prior downturn in the global financial crisis. Um, you know, some other kind of small pauses, we have at the market equity programs, which are a good sort of liquidity management tool that lets REITs kind of um, issue equity in smaller increments at a much lower cost than underwritten secondary offerings. Um, REITs have paid down a lot of their secured debt, so they had a lot of kind of uh, flexibility in their balance sheets. Um, the IRS sort of codified the ability with a revenue uh, proclamation for REITs to pay 90% of their dividends in, in shares versus cash, if, okay. if need be, which yep. may come in handy. Uh, <laughs> yep, as yep. in the downturn, um, yep. you know, we're seeing now that may come in handy. Um, they'd carved out uh, you know, joint venture assets from the unencumbered uh, covenant in their bond indentures for the most part. So, you know, on all these different metrics, um, you know, less development, they're more conservative in their uh, development strategies. They really were looking, um, looking strong. And, and I think that's really going to help them a lot as they navigate this incredibly unusual, unforeseen environment that we find ourselves in. So, you know, as Scott mentioned, we published a report um, a couple weeks ago. Uh, and you know, at the time, I think, it, you know, the consensus around coronavirus and, and how impactful it was going to be was still, you know, evolving. Um, and yeah. there were a lot of different views uh, even then. Um, but we kind of, you know, we're beginning to see the impact, certainly, and there's more discussion around it. Um, and we felt like, you know, we wanted to comment on the different property types. Um, and, you know, as I sat there and kind of thought about the the property types, um, you know, and tried to force rank them, it became clear to me that, you know, there were a lot of different dimensions in play and thinking about the risk, right? To just sort of assign one single, you know, high, medium, low, um, didn't kind of capture some of the nuance, right? So some of the easiest calls were, you know, uh, like the hospitality sector, right? You've got yep. the shortest lease terms, um, kind of nightly, uh, you know, hotel leases, you've got, you know, discretionary demand, um, you know, and you can immediately see 
and we could already see sort of in other parts of the world the impact that it was having. Um, when Marriott reported their uh, fourth quarter results kind of in late February, um, they mentioned that in China, RevPAR was down 90%, 90. Um, and in Asia Pacific, it was down 50%. And, you know, about a month on, you know, as an aside, uh, I think occupancy is still hovering around 20% in China. So that's a little discouraging. Um, yeah. that we haven't seen a little more bounce there. But, yep. but that, that was kind of an easy call, right, um, on the hospitality side. And I guess as we started thinking about it, we said, you know, we really need to think about this in a few dimensions. There's, there's kind of the, the stability of the cash flows, which can vary for REITs from like nightly hotel leases, um, you know, all the way to sort of long-term triple net leases to credit tenants, right? Where you, you have kind of minimal um, cash flow volatility risk, assuming the leases perform. Um, and so we, we, we thought about risk along that dimension. And then we kind of said, well, you know, in some instances, we've got these great long-term leases um, with reasonable coverage, uh, you know, of the rent, whether it's casinos or healthcare facilities, but, but we can't ignore the fact that the underlying tenants are disproportionately impacted by, you know, what we're seeing in response to the coronavirus, right? Whether it's on the healthcare side where, you know, the disease can really ravage some of the, uh, you know, the senior housing and skilled nursing facilities if it does yep. kind of get in there. Um, you know, on the gaming side, even though the gaming rates have long-term triple net leases, um, you know, if casinos shut down, as they have in many instances, that puts a lot of stress on the, the operator tenant, yeah. um, which ultimately they will come looking to the landlord to help kind of, you know, uh, uh, offset some of that uh, pressure, whether it's a temporary sort of rent uh, uh, abatement or forbearance, um, you know, what have you. Uh, you know, you can't outrun the economics of your underlying tenants forever, right? In the short run, you know, having good coverage can help, but like, if they're not performing, they're, they're you know, you're performing. gonna have to, you're gonna have to adjust, yeah. And so, so we we said, you know, that's kind of another dimension here. Um, and then the other one was just a concentration risk, and, and that idea was born more out of, you know, initially some thought that there might be these clusters of um, high kind of uh, uh, disease rates, you know, different parts of the the economy, you know, different markets, and and that could disproportionately impact people. So, like a Vernado or SL Green that are concentrated in Manhattan, right? And they have long term office leases, which is a positive, but um, they also have retail at the base, and Manhattan's kind of the epicenter of coronavirus here in the U.S. So, um, so it's really those three dimensions with maybe a little emphasis, a little more emphasis placed on uh, the immediate sort of cash flow volatility. Um, and also, you know, to a, to a lesser degree, but still a, a high degree, the, the underlying tenants and, and the impact that they're going to see. And part of that, too, is because when you think about volatility um, in shorter terms, meaning in lease terms, meaning more volatility, um, outside of hotels, you quickly come to self-storage and multifamily. And self-storage tends to do well um, what they call the three D's. They thrive on disruption, but like death, divorce, deployment, <laughs> all big, uh, big drivers of self-storage demand. Um, and so, you know, our thought was uh, setting aside, you know, some of the more dramatic potential economic impact that is being bandied about today. But, you know, initially it was, well, if people are kind of hunkering down, they're just going to renew their self-storage. They're not going to try and deal with this right now. You know, that's okay. kind of... Sure. Uh, renew in place and um uh and so that should be you know the retention rate should offset some of that risk in sort of monthly leases that we see mm -hmm. and same thing with apartments to a degree right um setting aside you know these numbers have been thrown around now of like 20 percent unemployment or 30 percent unemployment where you know if that's the case you know all bets are off but um right. but otherwise you know uh depending on the length and severity, I mean, most people aren't going to be out looking for new apartments. You know, they may just renew their lease, maybe on a shorter term basis, but should kind of keep the cash flow coming in for those REITs. The other great thing about apartments, um, you know, they have GSE supported financing, the government sponsored okay. enterprise. And, and 
those agencies have a counter cyclical lending mandate. Um, so even through the last downturn, they had access to attractively priced <laughs> secured mortgage capital, not right. just the, uh, the onerous uh, rates and, and low advance rates that the life codes were willing to give for you know, some of the other property types. So, so, you know, that was part of the reason for, for thinking about risks in a few dimensions. I'd say relative to our initial um, report that we, we put out, our intermediate term risks um, that we, we kind of thought about when we thought about retail and some of the, you know, uh, healthcare, triple net, um, you know, gaming, triple net. It took about a week for, <laughs> for those to come to the fore. Um, you know, and, and that's really been, that's where we're spending a lot of our time. I, I apologize, uh, getting another call, so I'm just going to decline it. And okay, no worries. Yeah. I lost the, uh, you there? Okay. There you go. Gotcha yeah, I lost the visual there for a second, but hopefully <laughs> it didn't disconnect. Um, uh, yes. So anyway, so um, yeah, I mean, kind of, uh, as you saw these dramatic changes, right, where, where now all of a sudden, New York is mandating, New Jersey's mandating that all non-essential businesses close down for a period of time. Right. I mean, you know, that means all of Darden's restaurants practically are shut, you know, in, in these major markets that, that capture, you know, whatever it is, two thirds of the population or, um, you know, and, and that's dramatic, right? And even though they're, they're strong entities and they've got, you know, uh, credit facilities that help provide liquidity, I mean, when your revenues go to zero, um, liquidity yeah. is kind of and, the you know, point, right? Yeah, exactly. And and so while you know everyone hopes and, and I think expects still that this is, you know, we can't run like that forever. You know, this is kind of a, a bend the curve, you know, shorter term dramatic pullback to kind of mm -hmm. ease some of the pressure on the healthcare system. Um, there's still a lot of uncertainty about how this economy kind of reanimates um, yep. you know as we come out of the other side of this and so that's what's I, I think been um, particularly challenging for us um, I mean certainly in the b-mall space you know we already know that they're challenged by you know internet competition um, financing sort of secure mortgage access has evaporated for a lot of those uh, malls particularly ones that have sales per square foot you know below call it $400, um, you know, sort of tenant productivity because mm -hmm. we're kind of unsafe at any speed. Um, and so, you know, but now as we look at it and we see, you know, there's going to be more stress on some of these marginal retail tenants, possibly even some of the anchors. What none of us really knows um, for sure is kind of what co-tenancy clauses are in these leases. So, right. you know, in some cases, um, you know, if a certain anchor goes out of business, uh, the inline tenants may have the ability on their lease to just cancel that lease. Right. Um, and, you know, that's kind of disclosure that's, I mean, that's lease by lease um, and not something that is disclosed or could really even be workably incorporated, but is a real risk nonetheless. Um, the other issue too, I think, is that, you know, in repositioning these malls and making them more experiential, they've targeted, you know, the types of tenants that are exactly, you know, hit the hardest by, by what we're seeing, right? In a lot of cases, yeah. could be even regional sort of restaurant concepts, sort of, you know, sit down, uh, casual dining. And, you know, heretofore, it's been something of a benefit to the REITs, right? Because in a lot of cases, they're replacing old legacy anchor Sears leases that were maybe paying $5 a foot or something, you know, super mm -hmm. low right. um, that reflected the heft that they brought to the mall, you know, 30 years ago. Now they're putting in a, a restaurant that's maybe paying $15 a foot or $20 a foot. So they're, the mall owner's cash flow goes up, but they put a lot of capital into those leases <laughs> too. Right. And they need those leases to perform over the term of that lease. And if yeah. if they don't, you know, because of this exogenous event, I mean, that's that's problematic. Um, that's that's not money they're going to get back. That's not a a fungible build out, really. In a lot of cases, um, that other tenants can just step right into and, and right. use. So, 
Um, and those so tenants you, don't have yeah. the financial wherewithal that you might see in an anchor or an investment grade or even not investment grade anchor, right? And so if they have to close for a week, four weeks, eight weeks, most of them really can't survive that, right? No, I, I don't think so. I mean, it's hard to, you know, we don't have sort of empirical data on it, but we certainly know, you know, I think 80% of Americans live paycheck to paycheck. And I think, yep. you know, 55% or so of, uh, of Americans are, are uh, paid hourly. Now, some of that's like unionized labor or whatnot, mm -hmm. but, um, and I'm, you know, working from memory here. So feel free to fact check me on yeah. <laughs> uh, with the Google machine. But, um, but yeah, uh, but, you know, that's more, I guess, um, uh, you know, individual focus, but, you know, those are the individuals that own these businesses. And I think to your point, in a lot of cases, they just don't have deep pockets. You know, right. if it's a Maggiano's or, a, you know, a cheesecake factory, you know, it's a, it's a little bit better. Um, but in a lot of cases, these are kind of like regional concepts you maybe haven't heard of um, and pretty big units, you know, right. like the size of a cheesecake factory or something like that. So, yeah. Uh, you know, particularly in B malls um, or hotels have gone in there or, you know, any number of experiential, AKA you need to be around a lot of people. Yep. Which <laughs> you don't want to be around, around right, together, now. right Exactly. <laughs> so, um, so that's, you know, I mean, it just couldn't be kind of worse uh, uh, timing for, you know, I mean, for the, for the B malls in particular. Grocery anchor is tougher, right? I mean, I think um, obviously the grocery anchor is doing pretty well. I think people are buying five times their average uh, yes. you know, weekly <laughs> groceries, literally. That's the number I've heard bandied about. Um, you know, that won't last forever and they're pulling forwards in demand, but still. Uh, but that's not really where these centers make their money, right? I mean, they may not even own that grocery box. And if they do, it's, it's also probably a pretty low anchor rent um, right and it's more the in with no with no overage rent right very little you yeah. know if, if any um as we've talked to some of the retailers but you know you you certainly have um the sort of mom and pop tenants in those grocery anchor centers the, you know, the nail salons the, the barber shops and things like that some could be national but in a lot of cases it's you know small businesses with with that lack deep pockets so you know, we're trying to figure out, you know, how do we sort of yeah. think about this in the ratings? Do we think about rent abatements for a period? How do we kind of incorporate um, some of the actions the government's taking to, to try and support some of these businesses and employment, et cetera? Um, just a lot of moving pieces and no great historical analogs to, to bounce right. it against. Right. So. Well, that's yeah. an interesting point. I mean, this was written on, uh, this came out on February, March 10th, right? And so that was 14 days ago, which is probably about 1,800 news cycles ago. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, I think that was before Simon <laughs> shut all their malls in the U.S. Yep. Um, before, you know, Washington Prime followed suit. They followed suit maybe like a week later. It yeah. feels like a week. It might have been the next day. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but it, it uh, week, though, right? yeah, I mean, I think it was before New Jersey mm -hmm. ordered the shutdown of not, all non-essential businesses. So maybe even New York. So yeah, I mean, you know, uh, I mean, yeah. quickly that conversation <clears throat> from like this hypothetical, well, you know, these tenants are pretty stressed. Like this, the, the, the landlords can't sort of evade all this impact to, oh my gosh, every business is shut, you know, and people... I mean, there's there's folks just sort of throwing out the notion that, you know, some retailers may just invoke force majeure and just not pay the rent. And even if the landlords aren't good legal standing to fight that, they'll fight it. You know, they'll just, you can, we'll litigate it, you know, and I'm going to hang on to my cash for the next six months. And if I have to pay you down the road or whatever, I will. But, uh, but you know, they may just sort of try to save, hang on to whatever cash they can. And so right. we're, we're certainly hearing as we talk to more of the issuers, um, you know, they're starting to come in these requests for rent abatements and it varies, you know, it, it um, some are big national public companies. Um, yep. Some, you know, some of those have, have not asked for anything, you know, and have kind of indicated they, they don't plan to others have so sort of like very different strategies. Hmm. Um, you know, I think a lot of the, you know, for a while, the, the view was that, you know, they're maybe waiting to see what kind of 
um, stimulus package we get and, and government support before they kind of make that ask. But right. it does seem like they're starting to make that ask. Okay. And the retailers have to kind of face, you know, what are they going to do? I mean. Right. So there's a lot of second order aspects that just aren't knowable yet. And so you're trying to game them out, like what if, what could happen, right? And so to which you come back to cash flow stability, like, okay, you've got leases, they're in place, hopefully subject to possible force majeure, right? You've got clean balance sheets and historical liquidity and access to capital markets. But the longer yeah. this plays out, the more stress there is and, and some systemic financing, right? Yep. Um, and you start burning through some of those liquidity features. So um, I guess, generally speaking, um, this outlook and kind of your general outlook today presupposes kind of a middle of the road outcome, right? So yes, there's a, a term, but it's, it's a limited duration to shutting things down to fight the virus. Don't mm -hmm. know what that is. Call it two to four weeks, right? There's going to be a lot of pain, but there's not going to be a significant uh, number of bankruptcies and unemployment, maybe unemployment doubles, goes from three to six. I think your ratings could probably survive that, you know, mm -hmm. et cetera, paribus, right? Mm -hmm. um, a relative, um, call it a 25% pullback in availability of capital. However, you mm -hmm. want to try to measure that, you know, the equity markets are closed for funding for a year, maybe. Um, bond market, touch and go, maybe half, of li half as liquid as it used to be. Commercial mortgage market, probably maybe a little more liquid kind of depending on on TALF and TARP and whatever else mm -hmm. might come come to fruition from treasury um mm -hmm. so maybe maybe decent liquidity there mm -hmm. um private equity markets i'm hearing uh more so that you know i think a lot of private equity market participants are watching the public markets and anticipating the same velocity of change uh, and they're not seeing it in the private market, obviously. And they're thinking that there's more stability there. Mm -hmm. I've had multiple conversations with people in the past week and a half. And I remind them, it's only been two weeks, three weeks max that we've been in this situation, right? So we have zero data points. The private market moves at a glacial rate compared to the public markets, whether it's debt capital or, or equity capital. So mm -hmm. we just don't know what's going to, to play out on the private equity side just yet, right? Mm -hmm. So I guess kind of a long-winded way of me kind of summarizing um, where we are um, and asking if there's a possibility for you to kind of frame um, in, in qualitative measures, how long could we, or how much of a duration of this event could we sustain before ratings really get crushed or before we start seeing, you know, I don't anticipate seeing bankruptcies, um, you know, GGP, uh, was a kind of a unique situation in the last mm -hmm. cycle. Um, mm -hmm. But do you anticipate or do you see a situation kind of evolving where you start to see some REITs facing down, equity REITs, not mortgage REITs, facing down bankruptcy situations? Um, for the most part, no, right? Because it, REITs is really an investment grade sector by and large. And, and the reason for that is that it doesn't make sense to be a high yield REIT issuer because you could borrow a heck of a lot more cheaply and efficiently in the secured mortgage market if you want to have that type of leverage, right? Yep. Um, versus going high yield bond issuance. So, so the REITs that are rated, you know, that we deal with, um, they want to be unsecured bond issuers. And why do they want that? They want the flexibility um, and speed of execution and size of execution that the unsecured bond markets afford them, right? So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it can be cumbersome and, and, you know, painful to kind of get individual mortgages on each property. You know, you got to work with the bank and get appraisals and environmental studies and all these different things um, can take months. And then if you want to reposition the building or move tenants around in your portfolio to kind of help everyone win, you got to go get approval maybe. And so, you know, a lot of REITs, because of their operating strategies, um, because of the size of their capital needs, um, they like to be able to go to the bond market and overnight raise, you know, a billion or $2 billion um, and, and have, you know, some financial covenants that um, preserve some asset value or some collateral value for bondholders, but unspecific, you know, right. um, a pool of unencumbered assets, not this specific yep. asset. Um, where am I going with this? So, 
what was the question initially? It was uh, <laughs> yeah, you know, oh, our ratings and what, what are we seeing? Yeah. yeah. So so most of them are IG, um, and so you know while it's low IG, kind of triple B, which um, is more susceptible to downgrades in a downturn, and, and certainly this is kind of this is a short run a bad one. Uh, we'll see kind of you know throughout the whole thing how it stacks up relative to other downturns. So, um, but you know IG. Uh, you know, it could see more migration into high uh, speculative grade, but um, but certainly, you know, it's not like they're single B or you know low double B where you would expect a lot of migration through the cycle okay. in terms yep. of ratings, right? And so, the the way I mean that kind of is how we are positioned entering this. The way we've been kind of guided from from you know, the senior folks in Fitch to, to think about this and think about developing rating cases um, for our issuers is, you know, we'll probably see a more severe stress than, you know, uh, quicker, deeper um, than the prior two downturns, whether that was sort of around 9-11 or the global financial crisis. But then because of this unusual constriction on economic activity from like social distancing and um, you know, shutting down the businesses, there's almost a, a, a more certain assured bounce back, you know, a quicker sort of bounce. And I think right now what we're struggling with is where does that ball sort of stop? You know, as it bounces right. back up, is it, is it, you know, initially I think there was some hope that maybe it's like a hundred percent of kind of 2019 levels, you know, it just, this is just a kind of a blip and we got to do this, go through this unusual period, but the economy is strong underneath and, and we'll kind of get back. I think as this has sort of worn on and, and you know, people have seen, um, you know, the, the layoff announcements and furloughs and, and just how severe this can be, um, uh, you know, that's looking less likely, right? And, right. and um, so as it relates to REIT specifically, um, we started off talking about how they're different from industrial corporate. So, so the way that they've kind of positioned the thinking for in the corporate side is think sharper downturn, quicker, some bounce back. And then if, if the company can kind of, you know, bounce back to a reasonably healthy level, redirect cash flow to kind of bring leverage back to within our rating ranges for the given rating, our sensitivities by call it the end of 2021. Well, Maybe that's an affirmation stable. Maybe if it's in a particularly hard hit sector with a lot of uncertainty, like hospitality or something, maybe a negative outlook or watch. Um, okay. If they're gonna be beyond our sensitivities by the end of 2021 and kind of a rating case, it could be a rating action or, or certainly, you know, kind of a, a negative outlook or watch. Um, what's, what's unique about REITs is we said up front, like, they're different from your average industrial corp because they've got contractual cash flows, usually to credit tenants and you know, based on long-term leases. And so, um, but on the other hand, they can't really retain much in the way of cash to kind right. of repay that debt, right? So as we think about some of these scenarios and talking about retail and rent abatements and everything else, um, the way I think we approach it is we may go through a period of, you know, couple months, maybe a quarter, where a certain percentage of the leases need, you know, some abatement, um, you know, we'll, they'll probably make it up on the back end either through, you know, some higher payments or maybe they'll extend the terms, something to kind of advantage the REITs, you know, get something back for sort of the, the leniency or maybe, you know, if um, put some percentage, you know, rent into the, you know, into the lease or some way to recapture it, but we're not even going to bake that in. But but for the most part, because they've got, you know, revolvers that are mostly untapped and, and, and sized at about 10% of gross assets on average, it's a big number, you know, for REITs, um, you know, because they've got contractual cash flows, because markets were accommodative and they could pull forward their 2021 and 2022 even unsecured bond maturities and they refinanced a lot of those, okay. they've got a big runway. <laughs> Right. And so even if you kind of assume, you know, a, a temporary blip in the cash flow, at the end of the day, they're still contractual. And so if you know, the economy is OK and the tenants generally perform, it will come back to what's contractual by the end of 2021. And, um, and maybe they'd have a little more debt if they had to, you know, 
fund some negative cash flows, um, but then they can also pay stock dividends and do some other things to kind of husband some cash. So in that type of scenario, um, you know, it, it generally looks stable for REITs, right? Um, I mean, you know, if you're thinking about the sensitivities, I mean, I think where you see stress is if the underlying tenant is, you know, particularly hard hit, take like healthcare, right? Um, yep. Right. The good news is they have diversified portfolios. They may own uh, life science centers, medical office buildings, skilled nursing, senior housing. Senior housing, they could take risk like an apartment owner where they get monthly mm -hmm. rents, or they may lease it to an operator, triple net, right? Okay. So that's much right. more stable. Problem is a lot of those triple net leases, the coverage is so thin, like 1.1 times rent, that they weren't really covering the rent hardly before this downturn, and they certainly aren't now. So there you might see um, you know, some renegotiated rents to help the operators that don't really come back, you know? And that could take yeah. leverage up. Um, you know, certainly on the on the part of the portfolio for senior housing where um, it's more multifamily like. I mean, number one, they're going to experience a high amount of turnover, unfortunately. Um, you know, just everything we know about sort of the, the, you know, death rates and sort of the, you know, that age group right. is, uh, is challenging. Um, and also at the same time, there's such strict restrictions uh, on those facilities at this point. Like they can't even bring new tours in of like people to kind of write you know, new arguments. So, um, so for issuers that are close to their rating sensitivities, maybe they were already kind of running high to the downside um, and they're in sectors where it's a little more problematic, you might see more negative outlooks. In other sectors where they were kind of, you know, maybe even operating closer to their upgrade sensitivities, um, mm -hmm. they've got a good amount of headroom. And even if you assume some, they help their tenants along for a, a shorter period, still by the end of 2021, they, they look pretty pretty good okay. you know they, okay. they stay within yep. the rating so it's just it's really going to depend but i think for the most part you know it'll be outlook driven and it'll be related to the sectors where they have the least amount of headroom and the greatest amount of exposure okay that makes sense look you're much smarter and knowledgeable than me on this uh stuff in this sector at this point but uh, i agree that's where i i was viewing the REIT bond market coming into this uh balance sheets were much much cleaner than they were in the past um, cash flow, access to capital, very diversified, very good. Um, and I don't see the same systemic risk. I don't see mm -hmm. us facing the same systemic risk as we did during the GFC. Obviously, all that can change in a matter of days. Um, but if you still have bank funding and whatnot, that's a nice kind of, I'll call it, uh, end of the day backstop to liquidity, right? So, mm -hmm. yep, for what sure. And, and everything we're hearing is the banks are, are being very accommodative. Yep. Cool. We've seen a lot of revolver draws, sort of defensive draws, and so yeah, you know, they're from really more from companies who probably won't have that access in you know one or two or three quarters, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, yeah. but you know, on the healthcare side, uh, I think that's yeah. true down their whole facility, and so yeah, that's true. Yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah, they're good, strong company. So but. yeah, and some other triple nets um, that have some challenged tenants, but um, but theoretically more stable leases, but right. Cool. We'll see. Well, look, um, I appreciate you playing a calendar tag with me to, to make this happen. I know you're incredibly busy and I've definitely taken way more of your time than I, than I asked for. Uh, no but I think this is really helpful um, in conjunction with your report. I think this will give my students a lot of color to wrap up their analysis. So I appreciate it. Sounds good.